All right, what's good, guys? Welcome back to another video. If this is your first time, I encourage you to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to be notified every time I post another video. Now, as you guys can see, I got my boys up in here with me. Um, it's Reformation Day. We're going to be talking about the Reformation, um, about a little bit about the life of Martin Luther, the importance of the Reformation, why we celebrate this day, and how we can apply the principles that Martin Luther applied in his own life to bring about Reformation and apply those things in our own lives. So happy Reformation, guys. Um, these are my boys. I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Um, Joshua, you can introduce yourself, uh, what you're about, what you do on TikTok and your ministry and all that stuff. Um, what's up, guys? I'm Joshua. Um, I'm an apologist. I usually do debates. Um, I have a TikTok account. I run a website, um, GenevaTheology.com. Yeah, that's, that's it. Presbyterian gang, you know what's up? <laughs> well, I guess I'm next. Oh, uh, you know? Yeah, you can go again. Yeah. I see. Michael Cruz, as you can see, the name tag here. Um, I'm a future voice, voice college student, 2021. Uh, my dream is to be a theologian and then a, a, a apologist to debates in real life and just glorify the Lord through my knowledge, um, build up the body of believers, and bring those who are away from the church to the true church. Um, not to the one that has tradition, but to the one that has the gospel. Uh, and most of my time, I read and do my research on Roman Catholicism, and that, that's what I want to do in the future, focus my ministry on Roman Catholics. Um, my name is Hector, um, also known as uh, Theology Spoon. I make uh, theological videos on TikTok. I uh, don't mostly show my face because I rather let the content speak for itself, but uh, I'm sort of like a scavenger hunter. I listen to sermons and lectures and then upload the most insightful parts, and it's worked out pretty good. And uh, my my purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever and whoever can hear that 60 second 30 second video and be benefited from it glory to God yeah and then my name is my name is Kwebna Duku uh, you can call me Kevin that, that's my American name most people call me Kevin um, I am 17 and I, uh, I have a website like Josh it's bkim.tech.blog I do have a TikTok account. I make videos on there. And in the future, I plan to specialize on focusing on the prosperity gospel. I feel called to go back to my home nation of Ghana to be a pastor there because there aren't too many churches there. And the churches that are there are very filled with the prosperity gospel. So I plan to major in that and do apologetics over there in Ghana where I speak the language and be able to reach my people. So that's just a little bit about me. I'm 17. I'm going to be going to secular school next year. So I'm ready to destroy some atheistic worldviews. I love it. I love it. And that and that's facts because if we go back home and I'm from Africa too. I'm from Congo. But in Africa, this is just filled with prosperity gospel yeah. everywhere, bro. And it's kind of sad. And I love that God has placed that in your heart um, to go back home and, you know, really, it's not um, just bring the gospel. Africa. I think it's all over the oh, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The world you, you can see oh, yeah, it in course. the States. Yeah. And, and you can see it down here in Central America too. They're yeah, very yeah. Wild. Ghana, they're very, they're very, they love Joel Osteen. I, they, the prosperity gospel to me originated from the States and it, it turned into a different beast when it got to Africa and some of the Latino countries and so on and so forth. But they, they listen to a lot of Joel Osteen. I can assure you of that. I don't know if Samuel's frozen. <laughs> Bro, I left by accident. I don't know yeah, what happened. Yeah, frozen. That was weird. But anyways, I'm back, guys. That's funny. Anyways, the, yeah, I'm going to say the devil made me do it, but like, I'm just looking. Wait, anyways, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I see it twice. Anyways, okay. hey, hey. Right, anyways um, so yeah, let's, let's get right into it, right? Um, so, Josh, the first question I have is for you. So why did Martin Luther even nail the 95 Theses on the door? Why did he even do that? Why, what compelled him to do that? Well, um, we'll just start now with medieval Roman Catholicism. Um, you know, the, the selling of indulgences that started in the 15th century 
um, the Roman Catholic Church started selling indulgences for the building of St. Peter's Basilica. Um, but Rome, not the slander Rome, the Pope was pretty clear but that these indulgences were only valid for the sinner that was contrite. Um, but then there's this rat named Johann Tetzel. Um, he went over to the peasants of Saxony and he said every time the copper, you know, every time a copper springs, a soul in purgatory, um, every time the copper rings, a soul in purgatory springs. So that is why Luther pinned his 95 Theses because of the abuse of these indulgences. Um, Luther, the major point is that he wrote it in Latin. He didn't wrote it in the common language German. Um, and then some students without his permission, they translated it into German and then it just spread everywhere. So, you know, and, you know, a secularist would say, you know, the Reformation was an accident. Um, we, we don't believe in accidents, we believe in the sovereignty of God. Um, but that's that's one of the re that's the main reason why Luther pinned his 95 theses. It was a uh, he had his um, affirmations and protests against the the abuse of the selling of indulgences. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so like he just said, he's seen all of this stuff happening um, with the selling of indulgences, the heresy that was going on. He was like, "What the frick is going on?" And he he was actually mad. He was actually mad that his parents were alive. Because he was like, yo, yeah. I can, if they were dead, then I can, you know, buy all these indulgences and they can get out of purgatory. But then he realized there's nowhere in scripture that teaches this. And, you know, that compelled him to write his 95 theses and nail it on the door of the church. So Hector, um, talk, talk about the effect of the Reformation. Talk about what happened after he nailed the 95 theses on the door. Because as you, as you know, bro, like everything broke out. People were mad. The Pope got mad. Everything happened. So speak about that. What happened after he did that? Yeah. Um, so essentially, Rome uh, was furious, uh, essentially. Um, Rome was all over Luther, and they wanted him to recant and to pretty much back out uh, these claims that he was affirming. But his conscience was captive by the word of God, and he pushed forward. And essentially... Um, he also considered himself uh, a practicing Roman Catholic, and his intention was not to split the church, um, but the church uh, anathized uh, the, 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 ref, uh, the reformers, uh, the people that were with Luther. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. So right after he did that, the, the, the church got angry, they started anathematizing him. They tried to force him to recant. And that's why the Diet of Worms, um, he went in front of them and they were telling him, recant, recant, recant. But he was like, and I'm going to paraphrase because I don't know exactly, but he said, unless I am convinced by sacred scripture, I will not recant. Um, because he said his conscience is, 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 is held captive by the scripture, by the scriptures, and it's not safe to go against his conscience. The Bible speaks about how um, it's not safe to go against your own conscience. And he was like, I will not recant. That's really one of the most inspirational moments in the life of Martin Luther. Um, when I first read about that, I was just like, yo, that's just amazing. Cause like he was willing to die for this. He was about to die. Um, but he was like, yeah. I'm not going to recant um, because this is the truth of God, uh, God's word. Yeah, and something I want to add yeah, I mean, was at the time when they were having the Diet of Worms, they asked the Catholic Church when they were asking him to recant of the statement, they asked him a question that they wanted Luther to just wrestle with and for him to answer. He was to answer the question, are you alone wise? The Catholic Church told him, you're going to have to stand before God and answer the question, are you alone wise? And of course, Luther didn't obviously just didn't answer it on the spot. He asked for time. I think he asked for like a few days or something like that. Mm -hmm. wow. he, asked for he asked for 24 hours to think it over. And as Luther struggled with this question, he came to the conclusion that he's not. He's not, and neither is the Catholic Church. Rather, Scripture is alone wise. God is alone wise. So if we focus only, if we if we focus, if we put our focus on Scripture and not our own our own um, like smarts or our own intelligence, if you will, we come to the conclusion that we are not wise, but God is. Yep. Amen, bro. Josh, you was gonna say something? Yeah, I mean, at the time in in you know October thirty first, fifteen seventeen. Luther was still a lover of the Catholic Church. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, that when, when his writings of 95 Theses just spread over all, all, all of Germany and finally landed in the heart of the Vatican, 
I believe it's Pope Leo the Tenth, right? Um, he said that you know the German monk he'll sober up soon, but you know that was just the beginning. That was just the beginning. Um, you know, there's you know most people say it was before, most people say it was after. I think it was after when he was you know studying. He was giving you know because Martin Luther was a teacher. Um, he was tasked to give you know you know lecture on the Book of Romans, and then he came across Romans one verse seventeen. Um, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And that's when Luther fully understood the gospel that the righteousness that sinners do not have inherently, it's not given through the means of the priest, but it's given passively by God by faith. And that was, you know, as Luther said, it was though the gates of heaven sprung open and I walked right in. Yeah, I like that. I want to talk about that. And I want to talk about that. I'm going to ask this to Michael to explain this um, because Martin Luther like you just said, like the turning point of his life where he, where he felt like he was born again was when he read that, Romans 1.17, the righteous shall live by faith. Um, the righteousness of God is imputed to us by faith. When he, when he understood that, his life changed because the Roman Catholic Church wasn't teaching this at all. So, Michael, if you can really touch on that and how the church has, even some evangel evangelical churches and Protestant churches has really abandoned that and has not really defended sola scriptura, I mean, sola fide as they should, and how that change in Martin Luther's life should be something that is consistent in almost every in Christian's life, because when we realize that, that, that we only can convert by hearing this message of the gospel, and we can only convert by hearing the word of Christ, and how Martin Luther just got radically changed by that, um, speak on that real quick. Speak on how the church really needs to, um, you know, preach sola fide and, yeah, and how it transforms our, our minds and our lives. Well, there are many things we need to understand. Uh, is that before the Reformation or before Trent, there was no dogmatic definition by Rome on um, how a man is justified. Uh, of course, we, they had the medieval view um, started by Augustine and other church fathers on uh, that we are made righteous, internally righteous. Uh, and, and it is a lifelong process. And, and he, and God declares us righteous when we get to heaven. Um, so this is very important because it, it took a while people in Trent to come up with a definition of the Catholic understanding of justification because there was no previous dogmatically definition. So the way Luther saw justification is completely in contrast with what was defined by Trent. For Luther, the change is positional. We are sinners and then uh, we change from position. Now we are righteous in the eyes of God. However, the Roman Catholic view is conditional. God changes our condition. So you receive the first righteousness or the first justification at baptism and then throughout your life you get more righteousness so it is infused uh, it's like a substance so once you are baptized you receive certain amount of righteousness that covers all your sins however when you keep walking in the catholic life you're obviously going to sin so when you do penance when you um, confess your sins, that is when you receive more righteousness to cover up those past sins. So in a nutshell, the difference between our view and the Roman Catholic view is that in our view, we are justified, but we're still sinners. It is a one-time legal act by God. And then in the Roman view is um, we are internally changed by God and we are only declared righteous when we acquire a righteousness of our own. That is the main difference because we stand on the righteousness of Christ alone. That is what the reformers taught by Solus Christus. We stand only on the merits of Christ. It is not our own merits. And obviously the Catholics going to say that they stand on the merits of Christ alone. However, they receive them by doing certain works. Yeah. Yeah, so Josh, can, or any of you, if can you guys speak on more in depth about the analytical justification of Roman Catholicism and how that does not line up with scripture at all? Yeah, um, when, like Mike was saying, just, just listening to Mike talk about it, 
Um, what the Roman Catholic teaches about justification is basically mission impossible. That's why they invented doctrines such as purgatory, the final boosting of sanctification before you can enter heaven. Um, they basically believe that the, dec the declarative act of God declaring sinners to be just in his eyes is a legal fiction. Um, and then Luther gave this illustration called Luther's dunghill. You know, it's, it's made fun of, but it's initially what happens at justification that inherently we are dung and the snow comes down and covers us and we're covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the reason why God can, can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, because the righteousness we need has been merited by another. Um, that, 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 that was the, the response by the Roman Catholic Church to Luther's teaching on justification, that it was a legal fiction. What Luther mm -hmm. taught is that we're simul this at peccador, we're simultaneously just, but we're still a sinner. And the Apostle Paul stresses that in Romans 7. Um, it means, yeah. Yeah, well, the things I want to do, I do not do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Um, he, Paul, this is, I, I believe that this is Paul talking about his Christian life. He's struggling with sin. We know that unbelievers don't struggle with sin. The Apostle Paul is saying that he wrestles with sin. Um, and the Apostle Paul never, never said that he could fall off his justification. The Apostle Paul knew that he was inherently a sinner. But externally, because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, he has been made right in the eyes of God. And that's, 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 what, that was, that's what the Reformers taught. And the Roman Catholic Church said this is a legal fiction, um, that justification is a lifelong process through the means of grace through the priest. Roman Catholic justification is sacerdotal. Sacer is the Latin word for priest. Um, that's that Luther really just, he said, no, we, we, we have access to God straight. We have access and we, we can be made right with God by faith. It is not through the priest. And that is essentially why they had the Diet of Worms, because medieval Roman Catholicism was crumbling under, you know, the, you know, the, the, the teachings of Martin Luther. Yeah. So another thing I want to I want to hit on. Yeah, oh, Mike, I you think that before before we continue, we should define um, what we mean by faith alone and why yeah. and, and why we differ from Roman Catholics, because many of my Catholic friends say that they believe in justification by faith alone, but it's a faith working um, through love. So uh, that's not Catholic teaching. Um, maybe Josh would like to define what the Catholic Church actually believes on justification or, or sola fide. Basically, yeah, like you, you laid it out a bit that, that um, through infant baptism, that is the first plank of justification and penance is the second plank if you fall off. Penance is made for those who have made shipwreck of their souls. That justification is a lifelong process through the means of grace that is offered through the priest. So you have confession, contrition, the absolvo, and then you have works of satisfaction. It's basically like a treadmill. You're just working up and down. And if you commit a mortal sin, that's why, that's why Catholics do contrition before they go to sleep. Because if you commit a mortal sin, you can fall off the plank of justification and go to hell and... Another means of grace is the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the center of Roman Catholic worship. Through the Eucharist, you receive grace, and, and I, I, it's, just, it's condemned in Scripture that they believe that, not that they're, they're sacrificing Christ again, but it is a propitiatory sacrifice to the Father, and that is a means of grace. But that sacrifice cannot perfect those who, drew, who draw, um, that draw near. And the Apostle, I believe the Apostle Paul, condemns that in Hebrews, that he, he makes the distinction between the Paschal Lamb, that you had it over and over and over again, never perfecting those, never making them whole. And then, then the, but for, you know, the Roman Catholic Church to teach that, it's, it's, com it's in complete contradiction of Scripture. But that's the basics that um, it's, it's through the priest, it's through the Eucharist, it's through works of satisfaction, passages they do, like Matthew 25. Matthew 25, they, 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 you know, that's the passage that they, they, I mean, I don't know, I think um, Edgar made a video and then, you know, they were like, you know, Matthew 25, Matthew 25. That's, that's basically what Rome teaches about justification, that you can increase justification, that through initial justification, therefore, they you merit justification. You keep going and going and going, but you can fall off. And yeah. so Kevin, the, the do you have anything to add? Position. Okay, Kevin. No, you, no, you, you, you can go. You can go. Okay. You and, guys can and, flow. And the biblical position, the one that we argue for, is faith alone. But this is not an empty faith. This is not an empty profession. Uh, it's not like I say I have faith. No, this is a true, living, saving faith. We try to make it very clear in our debate um, last week with Joshua. Basically, faith is the means by 
which, uh, which we receive the justification. And it's not the basis. The basis of our justification is God's grace. grace. And, and we get it because Christ has earned the merits. So yeah. the object of our justification is grace. The means mm -hmm. or the channel or the vehicle is faith. So when you have true saving faith, you receive that grace. And you can only earn that grace because Christ has earned his righteousness and he imputes it to us when we have true saving faith. Yeah, yeah. And the biblical support of that is that, and like, like you said, we're not saved by faith. We're saved by grace. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved. What's the vehicle? Through faith. Through faith. And I, I, I like this um, analogy where you, when you're at um, the doctors, right? They have this thing called a syringe where they, where they have a needle. And the syringe is the thing that is carrying and um, holding the medicine um, that is going to inject you, that the doctor is going to inject you with. The, the, um, the, 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 the needle is not the thing that saved you. The needle is not the thing that helped you get, you know, better. It didn't heal you. It didn't, it didn't help you. You know what I'm saying? It is the medicine in the needle that helped you. It's the same thing. That's what we're trying to say is that the grace is, is the medicine. Grace is the thing, the basis of our justification, but faith is just the syringe, the, the thing that is carrying the medicine. So that's what we mean by justification by faith alone. Um, Kevin or Hector, do you have anything to add before we go to Sola Scriptura? Another thing that Martin Luther fought for. A bit about how the church today has lost it. They've lost the fire of the gospel. They've lost the the original the, the original fire that Martin Luther had. And now, obviously, we've separated into Protestants. Obviously, there's Protestants of Catholics. But if a general Protestant, if I say the name Protestant, you, you're probably not going to think of a reformed person. You're probably not going to think of someone like Martin Luther. You're more than likely going to think of Bethel, probably Hillsong, some people of that nature. And, and we see today, we've completely lost what the gospel was. The most popular churches today aren't churches in the first place. And that, that's that's the saddest part about it. None of these people aren't preaching the gospel to its 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 teeth. No no one does any more expository preaching. People don't even do topical preaching. I mean topical preaching is fine. Where you just pick a, a certain chapter or verse in the Bible and you just you just preach from that. People aren't doing that anymore. Rather they're just coming up with something and then using, picking verses here and there to support it. And it, it's very sad because Martin Luther were to see what we were doing today, he would post 95 theses to build Hillsong. He would post, post another. <laughs> fact, no, that's fact. Yeah. This is the same exact non-gospel that the, the Roman Catholic Church preached. So we Yo, just it's crazy that you say that. It's crazy that you say that because I truly believe, I truly believe that if, if Martin Luther was alive today, he would post the 95 theses on a Protestant mm -hmm. church. Because, like, you, because you, uh, I, I'm pretty sure, and I guarantee you, you go to a lot of Protestant churches, bro, like, you ask them, how do I get saved? And I've tested this. I've tested this in a lot of Protestant churches, Protestant churches. I ask them, how do I get saved? Well, you have to obey the Bible. Well, you have to, you know, drop everything. and No, no, no. That is a result of your faith. But that's not the means by which we yeah. are justified. The instrumental cause of our justification mm -hmm. is faith and faith alone. And it's crazy how you can call yourself a Protestant church and not understand the basic principles of justification. And uh, the solo scriptura yeah. and solo scriptura, that's very, very sad. That's very, very yeah. dangerous um, for I, a lot of I, people to be under that. I think sometimes pastors genuinely don't give an opportunity for the people that gather together to actually hear the gospel um, because, you know, they're supposed to believe, but in what? And, and the problem is that sometimes pastors get caught up in pragmatism. They get caught up in other things that are not the gospel, you know, okay. and they, it becomes seeker sensitive and a whole, uh, it's a whole spectrum of things that they rely on other than the gospel. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like we're almost um, digging up the gospel again you know, from, from the pragmatism and the, uh, you know, new thinking that is dominating uh, our time. 
because yeah. right now, um, just like Luther, you know, uh, had to fight against the Catholic Church, we have to um, see Reformation within our denomination. Many of, many of them believe in a synergistic way of justification. And um, it, it, it ranges, you know, I was part of a church uh, that was super synergistic. And it was, it was all based on what you do. And this is within the Protestant church. Yeah, yeah. and that's very, very sad. And yeah. I think, I we, think don't... We, have, we have talked all, uh, about sola fide, but we haven't uh, brought the verses. So I'm just going to point out a couple, just real yeah, quick. Thank you. I, my favorite one is Romans 3, 24 to 25. It says, uh, well, from verse 23, from all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Forbearance, he has passed over for more sins. So, as so we wait see, a second, Michael. So I'm going to let you go after, but after Michael, so explain what you just read. And then what we're going to do before we go to Sola Scriptura, because I, I kind of really want to go to there. But so what we're going to do before we go there is everybody oh give your favorite verse that defends Sola Fide. So Michael, you can continue. So after you're done, Josh, and then um, Kevin. And then, yeah, As the text says, we are justified by the grace of God. And the only way we can receive this is through faith. Uh, many want to point out that Paul is not talking about other works. Like um, it, it says by faith, but it doesn't ex exclude works. Okay, now my question for that would be, can you show me one passage where I receive grace or grace is infused to me or righteousness is infused to me through works? Because Paul explicitly says that we receive the righteousness by faith. Now, can you show me one passage where we receive justification by works in the same context as salvation? Yeah, yep, yep. my, my yep, yep. favorite verse is Rome. My favorite yep. verse is um, Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses an indicative verb there saying that our justification is not a exhortation, rather it is a fact that um, it's an indicative fact. It has nothing to do with subjectivity, feelings. It is a fact, um, but yeah, that's what Hector? Yeah, one of my favorite Bible verses is 2 Timothy 3.16, that it says all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And I think this covers Sola Scriptura really good because we are to rely upon God's word and God's word alone. Um, man is fallible. And if we are to rely in our errancy, um, inerrancy, we're, we're doomed. And I think that we should rely only on God's divine revelation. Uh, my fault. Um, so yeah, my my favorite one is in Acts chapter 15. Um, for a little bit of context, right? So there's these people called Judaizers who were literally bothering the Gentiles saying that they had to follow the law of Moses and have faith in order for them to be justified. And Paul was just like, oh nah, nah, baby, nah. This can't this can't be happening. Um, so they, they had a council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 to discuss about this. And they came to this conclusion. So let me start in verse 8 of Acts chapter 15. It says, And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, the Gentiles, Peter speaking here, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. So he's basically saying, the same way that we gained the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, he came down to us and we spoke in tongues, is the same way that these Gentiles, these people who don't follow the law of Moses, they gained the Holy Spirit as well. Verse 9, and he says, And he made no distinction between us and them. Watch this. Cleansing their hearts by faith. He cleansed their hearts by faith. Verse 10. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither ours, 
which is neither our our fathers nor we have no, wait my, my fault which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear watch this verse 11 but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the lord jesus christ in the same way as they also are so he's saying peter is saying the same way that we were justified by grace through faith is the same way that these gentiles were justified by grace through faith and you you see a lot of christians and i see them um, arising a lot nowadays who say you have to get baptized in order for you to be saved Act, they use acts chapter 2 verse 38 a lot but you have to understand that these gentiles that peter was speaking to they gained the holy spirit way before they even did any type of work they gained the holy spirit before they even got baptized or anything um they were justified by faith by faith alone and a lot of my problem with a lot of roman catholics who like to deny sola scriptura is that when i look at passages like these like or Acts chapter 16 verse 31 for example where paul is telling people how to get saved when paul tells people how to get saved in the book of acts when peter tells people how to get saved the jailer who was about to kill himself in Acts chapter 16 and know yourself um, believe on the lord jesus christ and you will be saved you and your family it's crazy because if the roman catholic uh, roman catholic view a justification point blank period solo free day that's it that's it i don't know kev if you're back um but if not we're going to move on to solo scriptura and um, that's one of the other um, things that are you back? So if you can give one verse that um, one of your favorite verse that defends sola fide, and then we're gonna move on. This to has to be what Michael said, Romans three. I mean, all, all. I was reading it last night. I heard it last night. All have fallen short of the glory of God. No, not one. Not one is righteous. So if there's anything, if there's just, if I could only say one verse, if I was talking to a Roman Catholic, it would be Romans three twenty two. That's good. That's good. So yeah, like I said, solo scriptura is another thing um, Martin Luther proclaimed and defended. Um, so Josh, if you can speak on that, um, uh, what was the big deal? Because we know that Roman Catholic, Roman Catholicism, they claimed an authority that they did not really have. They claimed that they had authority from God. There's certain authority. Now we're not saying that the church doesn't have authority. That we, the church does have some form of authority, but final authority, Martin Luther said, was the word of God. Scroll of scripture. That's what we get our theology from, not from the church. We don't get our theology from the church. Um, they are not infallible. They are not equal with the word of God. It's scroll of scripture and the Bible and the Bible alone. So if you could speak on that and how Martin Luther defended that and how heavily he defended that. Yeah, I mean, what Luther was saying is that, um, well, where we see the subjugation of the scriptures under the authority of the of the church was in the medieval ages. Like, like I say, Roman Catholicism did not exist for the first few centuries of the church. That's when the scriptures were put under the authority of the magisterium. Those are the dark ages. The gospel was hidden. Um, and what Luther was saying is that, you know, church councils could err, um, church fathers could err, but the word of God cannot you know the word of god stands true um what L luther's thing is that the true church is the one that preaches the word and gives out the sacraments correctly um the, you know what what the roman catholic church was teaching in the 16th century is that it was our our interpretation you know the, the scriptures were only for people who were of high social status only only under the authority of the magisterium and that didn't exist that didn't exist Nowhere, nowhere in the first 300 years of the church. Yeah, that's true. Michael, if you want to add anything to the scripture, add anything to what he said. Well, sure. Um, first, I need to lay down the foundation of Sola Scriptura. I made a video on this on TikTok. In Sola Scriptura, it's not me and my Bible under a tree. Okay, we all have confessions. My Presbyterian brothers here hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith. I myself hold to the London Baptist. I don't dunk babies. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but we all we all have confessions of faith. We all um, write out what we believe and why. We all have uh, councils. We have the ecumenical councils of Nicaea and Constantinople. 
However, sola scriptura means that because of the nature of scripture, because scripture is theonoustos, because it is inspired by God, it should be our ultimate and final authority, okay? We don't just read the Bible and don't read commentaries. That's not sola scriptura. I, I personally read a bunch of commentaries. I read other books. However, I test them in light of scripture because of the nature of scripture. We are not denying the importance of confessions of faith. We are saying that scripture is the only infallible rule of faith. It's not the only rule of faith. It is the only infallible rule of yeah. faith because it is inspired by God. Yeah, and another thing I think, I think Catholics get wrong is that we we don't like we don't hate tradition. That may seem shocking for a lot of Catholics, but we don't hate tradition. We love good tradition, though biblical tradition. Yeah. Paul said in First Thessalonians, I believe, hold fast to the traditions which have been handed to you. Paul said it, but Paul wants us to hold fast to biblical traditions and. At the time in 1517, Roman Catholicism did not have good traditions. Speak on that, um, Kevin, if you can, if you can, or Hector, speak on that um, about how we do hold on to tradition and the misconception that we just hate all tradition for some reason. Yeah, sure. I mean, tradition. I mean, if even if you look what the Catholic Church was doing, their tradition at the time was to sell salvation. So what is the, if the tradition is to sell salvation and we're supposed to follow it? There is, if there, there's no issue with tradition. Nobody has any issue with tradition. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an old timey person myself. I don't even do too much like new school type of things. I like to do old things, the old style. So there's no issue with, with um, tradition unless it's unbiblical. If the tradition is unbiblical, then why are we doing it, right? If, if it's not found in the Bible, then there's no need to do it. But if it's, not if, it, if it's if it if it's biblical, then we can go ahead and do it. I mean, there, you can even look at uh, going to church on Sundays. I mean, I'm not sure how far back that goes, but that could be considered a tradition. Going to church only on Sundays, going to church on Wednesday and Sundays. But some some in the early church in the early days they used to meet every day, but we can look at things like that and keep that as a tradition because that's it's, it, 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 there's no contest with the Bible, but. Something is unbiblical, then there's no, there's no reason to to continue for it. And uh, just to yeah. kind of agree with Samuel and, and Kevin, um, the point of sola scriptura was not like most Catholics have in mind, which means that you know we got rid of all the tradition. You know, I, we we believe that sola scriptura is the ultimate authority, and healthy tradition can flow out of it. You know, um, and we must be diligent with scripture and see what is healthy tradition and what is not. And I think there's a fine line in there and it's our job is, you know, be diligent with scripture. But it's the point of authority and the, the healthy tradition that flows out of scripture. Yeah, that's so true. Um, I read a lot of church history. I love the readings of the father. Fathers, I just got a text from a Catholic person, you know, an Eastern Orthodox. He says, oh, you read the fathers? I'm like, yeah. Calvin, I was just reading Calvin today, Cal, uh, you know, Luther quotes Augustine like 2,000 times. All the reformers were quoting church fathers. Calvin writes in his preface to his institutes that he's not against the fathers, that the fathers would agree with what they're doing. So it's not like we just throw out all of church history. No, we, 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 we actually value it. It's that we stand on scripture and on scripture alone. And as Hector said, healthy tradition can flow out of that. I like that. I like that. I really like that. Um, if see, I, think I could have a comment on yeah, sola can... scriptura and uh, the differences between the Catholic position and our position, uh, a great passage to look at it, to, to look at will be Mark 7, where Jesus is facing the Pharisees. Yeah. And notice that he says, you have... Um, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition. Mm. And then he, he talks about the Corban rule. What is the Corban rule? Well, the Corban rule was a tradition by the Jewish leaders. It, it was an offering to God. So you made an offering to God, basically money. Okay. However, the way this started was to avoid giving money to your parents. In 
a direct commandment of God is to honor your father and your mother. So here, Jesus says, by following your own traditions, you have made void the commandments of God. Uh, I saw Tim Staples get around this passage saying, that, oh, no, 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 but the Corbin rule was not an inspired tradition. It's not from God. It was made up. But our traditions, they are inspired. Uh, and and that, that's how he got around it. However, the Jewish, every single Jew thought that this Corbin rule came from Moses. Even from the seed of Moses, they, they claimed it was from Moses. Yeah. So in the Jewish mind, the Corbin rule and the seed of Moses are inspired. They are true traditions from God. However, what is the rule of faith that Jesus gives to them? The scriptures. He goes back to the commandments of God that cannot change and won't change. Uh, that, that's for me, it, it's a great passage. It talks about the difference between our positions because many, many, many dogmas have been established in the name of tradition. For example, the bodily assumption of Mary or papal infallibility, indulgences, yeah. uh, the treasury of merits. When I ask my Catholic friends, can you show to me one passage uh, where treasury of merit is talked about or indulgences? They cannot. And then I ask them, can you point to me to one church father that taught uh, papal infallibility or indulgences? They cannot. And they appear to tradition, but tradition doesn't support their uh, their system either. So a question I have for you, Mike, then, is the only way that they can defend all of this stuff that they do, like the treasury of merits, is the only way that they could defend this based on their tradition? Or is there other ways that they try to defend their infallibility um, um, and their traditions? In verses taken out of context. Yeah. 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 Or... Or quoting councils, um, not the Council of Trent, because it, basically because the church said so. Um, yeah, I mean, dogma is literally yeah. means the be they, they're, they're of faith. Um, as Michael said, uh, you know, the Corban rule. Um, uh, if you look at rabbinic Judaism right now, it's just like Roman Catholicism. I mean, they, they do a lot of things that are not from Torah. They're just following the writings of rabbis. You know, nothing, and nothing's wrong with tradition. I read Calvin, I read Augustine, I read Aquinas, but uh, Aquinas is not Theonoustos. His writings is not from God. And I need to, and, what, and as Hector said, healthy tradition flows out of scripture. If we stand on the revelation of the triune God and we sit on that bit, and then we, we, we observe other writings, therefore we can, we can, we can make a judgment. Yeah. But if we're elevating, because a lot of Catholics have a very low view on scripture, very low view on scripture and that's ho that's horrible if we look the the opposite of god's law is chaos if we look this naturalistic material worldview it's it's a departing from scripture if we stand on scripture we will truly carry out our vocation we will be the salt and light of the earth but if we if we're if we're elevating tradition over scripture i uh, we're in error in my in my um so um briefly briefly because then I want to discuss of how actually before we even discuss that I want to discuss um, common objections to the Reformation common objections and I, I've heard a lot today in the Reformation that you know Catholics are coming out, coming out our next today um, but wait, wait, common objections, well, before, we before we do that I think um, I'm going to answer to a common objection to Sola Scriptura and they yeah, point okay, out good. they point out to Second Thessalonians 2 15 so then brother stand firm and yeah. hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by spoken word or by our letter. And here is the proof text, okay? Here, you have to stand firm to the spoken tradition, to the oral tradition, and to the written tradition. Jerry Matetic says, you Protestants are only following half of this commandment because you're only following what is written. My question for that would be, did Paul, in his oral tradition, talk about the bodily assumption of Mary? In this oral tradition that Paul is talking about, did he teach people?
because Paul at this time had already been in Thessalonica, so the, for the, the oral tradition here is his message, the gospel. He talks about the gospel. He preached there for three years. So this is not a mysterious tradition that only the bishops knew about and it's transmitted orally. No, this is this gospel that Paul wrote in Galatians and in Romans. So this verse completely is against the Roman Catholic position. Once again, if, my, if any Roman Catholic is listening to me right now, can you please show me where in history someone records that the, Thessalo that the Thessalonians believe in papal infallibility? Mm, that's good, that's good. Um, so yeah, I'm on, we're gonna cover one more sola and then we're going to go into the common objections to the Reformation. And after we do that, we're going to talk about the importance of bringing Reformation in our generation, how we can do that. Um, and yeah, so yeah, like I said, sola Christus, what does that mean? And yeah, what does that mean? Defend it, explain what that is to the people. Um, solos, solos Christus um, basically means that we're saved by Christ's work alone. It is not a synergistic thing. It is not through the sacraments. It is not through the Eucharist, but it, we're saved by grace. Through When we say faith alone, we say that we're saved by Christ alone and his merits alone, his righteousness alone, not us increasing or meriting justification so in order we may be made right with God. That's, that's basically a summary. You, know, you guys can go on if you guys want. Well, yeah. So, yeah, Christ's merits alone. Um, not our own, not some uh, merit that we have, but his alone. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Bible says in first, Second Peter chapter 1, um, there's two. This is Peter talking to the people um, in Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And he said, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what it basically means in Christ alone, by his righteousness alone. That is how we are justified. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, and this might confuse a lot of people, but we are justified by works. We're justified by works, but not our own works, by the works of Jesus Christ. And something that R.C. Sproul said beautifully is that Jesus did not only die for us, but he lived for us to gain merit so that his merit can be imputed to us by faith and faith alone. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, so, that's so true. Um, yeah, I mean, Paul, I, I'm not going to get into covenant theology because covenant theology was something that, that was, well, not necessarily, in, in a sense, rediscovered by the, the 17th century theologians. You know, Calvin had a sense of it, you know, Luther, Luther, especially Calvin, um, you know, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, but, you know, there's this distinction that Paul makes in Romans 5 that through the disobedience of our former federal head, Adam, his guilt was imputed to us. Through the obedience of our new federal head, Jesus Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us. And that's it. And through our union with Christ, we receive that righteousness by faith. And that's what, you know, just, expound, you know, you know, people, you know, covenant theologians, they were covenant theology was an apologetic that was, you know, used. They, it was used, you know, to defend against Jewish people who said the Abrahamic blessings don't belong to Gentiles. And that's what, that's what the reformers, you know, they had covenant theology that through Christ's obedience on our behalf, in our place, as our federal head, he can impute real righteousness to us. And that's why the virgin birth is important. That's why Jesus' life on earth is important. Every single moment of his life is important because if Christ sinned, then his sin, you know, he's, he's no longer a perfect savior. Yes, and uh, I, I love this um, this sola because I think it's so tightly close to the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus Christ and the work that he's done and how does that apply to us? And I think that's why this sola, I, this is one of my favorites because um, like you said, Samuel, um, it's Christ's um, life, death, and resurrection that uh, is applied to us. And, and that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's very beautiful. When I came to this realization i was just like <laughs> mind blown like double imputation is just so beautiful um in our salvation our sins are imputed to christ and his righteousness is imputed to us it's credited to our account that's why abraham said in genesis chapter 15 verse 6 abraham believed god and what it was reckoned to him it was accounted to him credited to him as righteousness like 
It's like, it's like if I have a money, my mom gives me money. I didn't earn this money. I didn't work for this money at all, but she gave it and put it into my account. Um, and yeah, so it's basically how it is with Abraham. He believed God and it was counted to us righteousness. That's what happened with us. We believed God and he, it, it was counted to us as righteousness. God gave us his righteousness. He put it into our account. So now that when we do sin, we are justified, but we are still sinners. But when we do sin, God doesn't look at us as sinners. He looked at the righteousness of his son. It's closed on us now. Like you read in Genesis chapter three, when Abraham and, uh, um, I mean, not, not Abraham, when Adam and Eve had sinned against um, God and they ate the forbidden fruit, they tried to go get something for themselves to cover themselves. And then after God had cursed the woman, cursed the serpent and cursed the man, it said he went and took something for them to close them, garments for them. And what's so beautiful about this is that God had to go kill an animal to get the, the fur of the animal and place it on Adam and Eve. That's what happened to us in our salvation. The same thing that God did for them, God did for us. The lamb was slain and through his sacrifice, through, just like in Leviticus, through the lamb dying, through the lamb of God dying, Jesus Christ, um, we may have his righteousness imputed to us. He clothes us with his righteousness. And it's such a beautiful thing. That's the gospel. Like Hector said, Amen. it's so closely related to the gospel and it's just so beautiful. And, and we I must defend what... it. We have to defend this. Because if we don't yes. defend this, we, can't, we don't have the gospel. We have to defend yeah. it. The and now that, we're of Christ. now that we're talking about Christ, another thing that um, I like to talk about when we're talking about the sola is the efficacy of the sacrifice mm. um you you once you're justified and believe in the lord jesus christ and, and, the, and god has changed the disposition of your heart you are never more justified from that point on there's nothing to increase there, there's nothing grown because the efficacy is is at the moment and it's effectual it really works and i think um uh, Michael touched uh, uh, the the counter argument for Catholics. You know, the, it's it's um, the righteousness. It's is something that continues, and for us, it's uh, it's effective and it's there and now when you believe. Yeah, that's so that's so true. I mean, the Apostle Paul, you know, he lays out Abraham, and you know, is this blessing only for the circumcised? It, the Apostle tells us the 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 significance of the sacrament of circumcision. You know, it was just a sign, you know, a sign of faith. But the apostle says that physical circumcision means nothing but spiritual circumcision. And that spiritual circumcision, the changing of the disposition of my heart, the giving of the spirit, the giving of the new heart. It's a sign and seal of that righteousness of our inheritance in, in Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit will never depart from us. And that's why the working of the spirit is, you know, comforting. Because it's a sign and seal of that righteousness that I that is not my own, but I've been received, I've been given by faith. It's amazing. Man, that's just so just so beautiful, man. It, it just brings me to tears every time, even right now, bro. As I was talking about, it, I'm just trying not to cry. It's just that beautiful, man. The gospel is just so beautiful. Um, so yeah, um, so before we go to how we can as young reformers bring another revival, another reformation to our generation, I want to talk about common objections. Um, and I know all of you guys have gotten them. Just look at all of you guys' comment section. And you were just flooded with a bunch of Catholics who hate Protestants, who hate Martin Luther. So what are common objections that you hear? And what are your answers to these common objections? Um, some objections that I hear is that um, um, the, the reformers didn't like church history. Or uh, they took out some books from the Bible. Or um, Martin Luther created, put in the word faith alone. Um, yeah, the, but well, I'll just answer the first one that the reformers rejected church history. No, Trent rejected church history, stopped being a church, and therefore they're, they're no longer Christian. When a church denies an essential doctrine of the gospel, in, in, in a sense, how we are reconciled to God, that is what Trent denied at the Council of Trent. And therefore, Trent 
is not a, is not a you know therefore the roman catholic church from then stopped being a christian church um you know that's that's when rome apostatized from us and if you read the, the writings of calvin mcclanton luther they identify themselves as a true church we are the catholic church trent has denied the gospel we are the true catholic church um you can go michael and t- tell us your the objections you yeah well it, it's funny to me when people say that martin luther removed um, seven books from the Bible uh, because this, okay, Catholic doctrine works like this. You cannot bind something upon all believers if it's not in an ecumenical council. Uh, so they point back to Carthage where the canon was defined. However, Carthage was not an ecumenical council. It was not binding upon all the church. So when was the first dogmatically canon given by the church? At Trent. So technically our canon came before Trent. Uh, something else is many, many great theologians rejected the Apocrypha. You, we just have to point to Jerome, Melito of Sardis, um, Cardinal Cajetan who interviewed Luther. So are, there are many, many people who rejected the Apocrypha. Did they remove the books or they're not just inspired? They were not in the Jewish um, canon and God entrusted them the oracles. So why should we accept the Apocrypha? But that's a total different subject for a different day. That's I'm just answering to one of the famous objections to to, to the first thing I hear, especially when I made that video a while ago when I talked about asking atheists or Muslims to show me where the Bible changed. Normally Catholics, like like in that comment section, the Catholics have to respond, Martin Luther did it. The, the, main, the main debate between us would be the Apocrypha, whether or not it is considered the word of God. We look at the Jewish people, although they, you know, they treat these books with respect, none of them consider it the word of God. We also look at the New Testament. We see Jesus, he never quotes from any of the Apocrypha. A lot of the time, and, and people, you can even tie this into some of these Gnostic Gospels, these just random things written in like 3rd or 4th, 5th century. You, you can see that it's different. You can see that it contradicts some of Scripture. It contradicts their historical er- errors, their he- geological errors. So a lot of the time, it comes down to actually looking at these books and realizing, well, they don't match up with the word of God. Jesus himself never quoted them, any of them. And Jewish people themselves don't take it as the word of God. Yeah. So we don't take them. Yeah. Um, Luther actually translated those books. Um, crazy. Um, but yeah, that's no Jewish person regarded the Apocrypha, Deutero, secondary, second canon. And nobody believed it was Theonustas. No, nobody believed it was God inspired. What I want to believe is what Jesus believed about scripture. And when Jesus on the road to Emmaus, he says, I'm going to take you through the law and the prophets. Never said the Apocrypha. That was all pointing to him. All along the prophets point to Jesus and, you know, the Apocrypha. It's just, it's, it's good for history. I mean, it's a, you can read it, but we don't, we don't hold it to the same standard we do the word of God. Hey man, Hector, you got any objections that you'd be hearing? No. Mm, well, the most common, and I think one of the most, uh, one of the ones that Catholics get really, you know, personal into is Sola Scriptura, because, you know, uh, that's the one that uh, you can't have purgatory or treasury of merits with, with you know, with, with Sola Scriptura, because like Michael said, you cannot find these things. So they, they, they highly strong man Protestants. And um, I think with a, if, it, if we were to have a conversation with a Catholic where we are explaining to them that the focus was an authority and we're not abandoning tradition, uh, we will clear out so much. But it, it's, it's mainly a straw man more than, more than an objection. My um, favorite if- one is that he was anti-Jewish, which is just not true. <laughs> if you read Luther or if you just read a biography, you will know that Luther was the one when the Jewish people came that treated them as real people. They, he, he advocated for them. He wanted them to have real jobs. Later in his life, he had a problem with them because they were rejecting the gospel. But he, he was not anti-Jewish. And if we want to talk about someone who has been anti-Jewish, we just have to point out to the crusades okay <laughs> exactly. um, one of, yeah so one one objection i i hear all the time is to to show the fide i want michael to speak on this because i know um 
he has studied this um, passage very thoroughly is in James 2. Obviously, we all know it. James 2. If, if, a, if a Catholic watches through this whole video, he's going to mention James 2. You don't know how much times a Catholic has mentioned James 2 to me. Let's, let's read it real quick. James 2, chapter 14. It says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no worth, works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Verse 17, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith, uh, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. And they love to say this. And I, I hear a lot of Protestants saying this, bro. It's sad. And, uh, they, like, they like to bring this up to, to, to um, try to debunk sola fide. And it's crazy. And it says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Verse 20. But, but you are willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless. Watch this. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar, you see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. So, Michael, if you could speak on what James is trying to convey to the readers, because they love to bring this passage. Yeah, well, basically, James 2 is the positive, is a negative uh, application of the positive command in chapter 1 and in chapter 3, in a nutshell. Uh, the, the contrast here is between living faith and dead faith. When you have living faith, you will have works. And when you don't have living faith, when you have dead faith, you don't have works. The definition that James uses here is of faith is a deedless profession of faith. Is I have faith. That's it. I, I, I believe in Christianity. And that's it. But you don't go to church. That, that's not what we believe. Um, and Abraham was justified by works, how he was shown to be righteous. That's how we have to interpret this passage because uh, Paul clearly talks about Abraham being justified by faith alone in, in uh, Romans chapter 4. So Abraham was shown to be righteous in, in, the, sight of Abra in the sight of Isaac and in, in the sight of every single person that reads this very uh, passage. Um, so yeah, this passage does not contradict sola fide. Why? Because it's not talking about how one is made righteous in sight of, in, in the eyes of God. It's talking about how one is shown to be righteous in the eyes of other believers. Uh, all of James is addressed to believers. It's not addressing new Christians or people who want to convert to Christianity. No, he's talking to believers. Yeah, that's so true. And, and something else that was discovered by luther I, I i highly recommend that everybody read it is his his you know book on the law gospel distinction and if you conflate the two you just cut christ in half what is there you know to be justified in the sight of god you need perfect obedience perfect obedience that's why paul says if you want to be justified by works of law keep all of it in order to be made right in the in the in the eyes of god you need to keep the whole law but what is the relationship? To, um, what is the relationship at, for a Christian to the law of God after conversion? It's an imperative that through the indwelling of the Spirit we get to delight in, not as a means of our justification, but a byproduct. I really love it. Luther writes in his commentary to the Book of Galatians: Christians are not made righteous by doing righteous things. Being made righteous, there's a huge distinction. We are made righteous, therefore we do righteous things it's not do therefore you can live it's you are alive therefore do and that's 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 something that even even hector and i we were talking about we're going to go live soon that it, it's something that is it's being attacked in the reform circles as well that we're going back to rome that in order in, instead of motivating our congregation to good works by reminding them of their union with jesus we're motivating to motivating them to good works by using the law in the first use to highlight our sin and to motivate them to good works because you know if you're not doing this you're not justified you're justified if you're doing this Hello? and it's 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 really sad um yeah 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 that's good um uh, you need to understand a christian's natural response to hearing the gospel and truly believing the gospel is living for christ but living for christ 
is not the means by which we are justified. And like I was telling my brothers here, I see a lot of people yes, and, who. And I want. I want to. You can go. You can go. No, go ahead, brother. No, 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 you good. You good. Um, one, one thing that I, I it fascinates me. It's that um, throughout Scripture, you see a tendency for legalism. Um, mm -hmm. what do I what do I mean by that? Well, let's start with Eve. Eve um was in the garden and she's told the, the serpent not to touch the tree. Now, if we go back to chapter one uh, and chapter two, God never said that, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so so the same thing the Pharisees do, they um they want to add things, you know, and, and and it all becomes this legalistic uh, theme. And another way that we can see it is with the prodigal son. The prodigal son, when he left and he was hungry, he wasted all his money. He said, if I can only go to my father's house and work my way up, you know, so we have this tendency yeah. for legalism and we have this thing that we need to rely on the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's yeah. it alone. May I touch on that? That's so true. Um, the natural way of thinking, we're just, we're fallen in our nature. The natural way of thinking is either antinomianism or legalism. What Satan tries to do to the saints of God is distort the view of God. Ever since the Garden of Eden, Satan, the fall of man was a doctrinal thing. And that's why reading the word is so important to, you know, to, you know, exalt our view of God. Um, when we have a legalist view of God, we're like, there's no, there's no reason to do it. I'm just going to do whatever I want. And if we don't, if, you know, that's why it's so important. Our view on God is so important because if we view God in a legalist way, we're going to, we're going to fall back into the covenant of works. If we, and the, the, the other response is that we just fall into antinomianism. But, you know, that's just really hammering out the law gospel distinctions. The law demands perfect obedience. The gospel pronounces, that's how God speaks to us. It's do, and then here it is. Like, for God so loved the world, that's gospel. And then this is, this is, um, this is law. If you love me, keep my commands. There's an indicative there, and then there's imperative. If the indicative is that you love Jesus, therefore keep his commands. And if we conflate the two, you know, because the Christian life truly should be summarized by joy in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That you have, you have the federal vision. Unfortunately, they're Presbyterian, but they they get it wrong. The new perspective on Paul. Um, you you know, you're you're we're heading towards legalism rather than the Christian life. Like like David in Psalm one, we say we delight in the law of God, not as a means for our justification. It's because we've been justified. Therefore, out of gratitude and love for God, I'm going to obey Him. If we conflate yes. the two, we're in, we're in, we're, in, we're in trouble. And there's a yeah. lot of there's some reformed preachers that are that are conflating the two. Mm -hmm. And to add a little bit to that, um, the mistake that we make is to see antinomianism and legalism here, when in reality um, they're inseparable twins, um, because the prodigal son that had left was antinomian. Yes. He was antinomian by nature because he, he said, I'm going to leave my father. But the view of his father was legalistic. He didn't see his father like a loving father, like a gracious father, like a merciful father. You know, and so, so, but, so even though he was antinomian, he had a legalistic view of his father. And that's something we got to be really careful of. Yeah, I like this. I like that. Um, so, my brothers, listen. And this is, might be one of the most important things we cover right now. Because we know how much, and I know how much all of you guys have a heart for our generation and just for unbelievers and for believers alike. Um, because the reason why I know this is because you guys are laboring every day, doing videos every day, um, you know, discipling people in the background. People don't even know, like, you know what I'm saying? Every day. Um, and we really appreciate that. So if you can tell the people, how can we bring another reformation in our day and age we have the resources we have social media we have all these things that we can use um but what are the key components in bringing a revival in our generation um and being a vessel for god being used by god um you know bringing the church of jesus christ back to the scriptures mm -hmm. um having people understand the doctrines of grace having people understand and having a high view of scripture um wanting to defend so the fide wanting to defend um so uh, uh, um, scripture and all these things. And, you know, like I said, having a high view of scripture and going back to the word of God, reforming itself back to the word of God. How can we make that impact in our generation? Well, uh, I think that the, 
mistake that many churches do is they try to create this huge plan, you know, and they plan everything out and we're going to do this and that's going to cause this. And then we're going to do that and it's going to cause that. And they make it a plan instead of a lifestyle. My advice for everyone listening would be go back to the scriptures. I mean, don't read Calvin yet. Don't read Luther yet. Don't read James White. Don't read R.C. Sproul yet. First, know your Bible. Yeah. When you know your Bible, you will be able to go to them and then test them. We're not asking you to believe what I say. We're not asking you to believe what Joshua says. We're asking you to believe what God says. Go back to the scriptures. Then you can come and test us and you can come our forefathers to see if what we're saying aligns with the word of God. And if everyone knows their Bible, then a second reformation will come very, very soon. Yeah. That's so, that's so true. Yeah. Just, you know, the Bible stand on the word of God, stand on it, you know, preach it, teach it. It's, it starts in the churches. What churches do is just, you know, their worship di dictates what they do, what they believe about God will dictate how they worship. Worship is not just a Sunday thing. I raise my hands up. No worship is, is an everyday thing. And if we're truly in love with God and his word, and it's, it's, the, it's the negative, you know, the negative view of theology, you know, oh, into, you know, being intellectual is a bad thing. Um, you know, it's just going to, you have a bunch of head knowledge. No, we're, we are commanded to love God with all our heart, with all our mind and with all our soul. So theology is not a bad thing. What we believe about God will dictate how we worship God. And that's so important. And how do we get to know God? God has spoken through his son, mm. through his prophets, through his apostles. And we are that's to amazing. treasure up his word in our that's hearts amazing. that we may not sin against him. That's, that's, that's just right. stand on the scriptures, love God. Even, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not an easy thing, but if when we're, when we're growing in our, when we're growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus, the more I know about Jesus and what he has done in my place as my federal head, as the second Adam, as my substitute, I'm going to love him more. I'm going to hate sin. Mm. I'm going to love righteousness. Just, just how we, how we view God, how we worship God. It starts in the church. It starts in the church. Then it goes to the home and then it goes to parenting. That's We just want to focus on the church, you know, churches, you know, churches like Bethel, you know, Hillsong, not standing on the word of God, how they dictate their worship. That has that has consequences. Elevation, it starts in the church, then it starts and then goes to the home, then it goes to the kids, and then it just goes on and goes on. We want to train our kids, you know, train a child up in the way it should go, that it may not depart from the faith. But yeah, make make America love theology again. Make Amen. America love theology. America was built on the triune God. Let's make America love theology again. It starts with scripture there's only one tool if we want to see another reformation if there's only one tool and that's scripture that's that's why i think expository preaching is so important because a lot of times people when they diverge or they stray away from um expository preaching then they start to add things and start to add maybe opinions and and, and smaller things like that no we need to start with expository preaching verse by verse until we understand what the grace of God is, because we're never going to reach anyone, especially in this generation, any Christian in this generation, for that matter, if we don't start with scripture, because the opinion of one is just an opinion of another. If we, if we go to church and hear one pastor say one thing, don't, they don't speak about the Bible. You go to another church and they say, say another thing and they don't speak about the Bible. Who's correct? Neither, because they didn't start with the Bible. So if we want to see some sort of revival, if you want to see something change, we have to go verse by verse in scripture. Anytime I talk about anything, I always want to give my verses, my references, because I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, no one is going to convince me of anything of God if they don't use scripture. I mean, I think that's the, even the mistake sometimes people make today. We look at people in authority. We look at uh, Bill Johnson, who's, I mean, he's rich. He has all this. And we're like, okay, he's a, a successful man. And we, we think we are to listen to him. So that's, a, that's an issue that a lot of people make today is that we just look at people in authority. We look at, you know, our pastors, our youth pastors, even, even people on TikTok with like a hundred thousand plus followers, right? We look at those people and we think, oh, okay, well, they're successful. They have a lot of followers. He has money. He, he has been blessed by God. Therefore, he, he probably knows what he's talking about. But we need to start with scripture. We need to teach the importance of scripture. People need to know the importance of standing on the revelation of the triune God alone, not of any any other man, not of any other um, 
any other person's opinion. It needs to be on scripture alone. I love it. I love Amen. the fact that we all that we all jump in there to Sola Scriptura because essentially the main question that we want to ask ourselves is what does God say about anything? He has revealed himself to us, right? And if we want to reform the church, right, with a loving heart and with an honest heart, we need to ask ourselves, what does God say about the preaching of the word? It doesn't need to be based on what I think what scripture says, or do I need to expound what scripture already says? What does God say about worship? What does God say about my marriage? What does God say about my relationship with my family? And it expands to every domain of your Christian life. So it's not just, um, it's good to understand that within the church, there needs to be a reformation, but every individual needs to renew their mind and renew every domain in their life, every branch, that every, every family member that you have in contact with. You need to make sure that you re reflect the image of God, that you reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. So re reform yourself by the renewing of your mind, but also understand that the essential thing is what does God say? Let's go back to scriptures. It's, it's a really loving and easy principle. Amen, bro. And, um, the, you know, since we're talking about Sola Scriptura and stuff like that, and how we're supposed to reform ourselves back to the Bible, Peter said in First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. You think about a newborn baby, how he cannot survive, or he or she cannot survive without milk, and how they long for that milk, and they will scream and scream and scream for hours until they get that milk. Because they, they desire it and they really need it. So Peter is telling us, like these babies, we need to long for the pure milk of the word that by it we may grow in respect to salvation. We need to desire desire it more than we desire anything. Um, this is our daily food. The Bible says in Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need to long for the word. And if we do not long for the word, like, 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 Kev just said, bro, we're just going to be blown away by every wind of doctrine. And we're just because somebody's mad successful and they are in author an authoritative position, we're just going to believe everything we say. You don't understand how much times I've talked and debated with uh, people who love people like Stephen Furry and Bill Johnson, all these people. And they're so brainwashed by these people because of their, uh, of their love for these people and because of the authority that these people have that I can bring as much scriptures as possible. They won't listen to me. Because because of how much they love these people and because how successful these people are and how much these people make them feel good. So if we do not stand on the revelation of the word of God, we're going to end up deceived and brainwashed. And this is like, it's amazing how much people will not listen to scripture because of how much they love their pastor, how much they love their leader. It's all because they do not hold the soul of scripture and all because they do not stand on the revelation of the word of God. Of yeah, God. that's true. Uh, there's a quote by Calvin. It says, true wisdom comes from knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. Um, you know, just there's the study, rapid study in, in, in 21st century culture of who is man. But we can't, we don't know who man is if we don't know who God is because we are creating the image of God. God's purpose for us is to reflect his holy nature. Man was created to be great, to be not an essentially a little God, but to reflect his holy nature. Jesus did that perfectly. And that is our purpose here on earth, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we can only do that through his word. We, we only get to know how to do that, how God wants to be worshipped, what he demands, what he deserves, and therefore what is my obligation since I am in a covenant with him. I can only know that through his word. And that is God's view for society, that the image of God will be restored to his image bearers. That is how God views society. You, you can read Ephesians 2 on that, being built on the foundations of the, the, the prophets and the apostles. That, that is, that, you know, one day there will be a new heavens and a new earth and the image of God will be fully restored and will be in glory. But until then, we preach the word of God because that's what the gospel does. The gospel gives people new hearts that they were born in rebellion towards God and they, they delight in, this, in submission. It's 10 o'clock. But um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for telling us. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. oh, yeah. computer. Well, <laughs> well, that was well, a computer. You know, Wait, the computer, really quick. The computer's trying to, okay, you, you good. Yeah, I was just going to say, we might, as people who would consider themselves reformed, 
we might have to be careful with that word because sometimes it gives us more of a, a, a secluded group rather than people who actually want to reach other people. In other words, sometimes when we throw around the word reformed and we say, oh, I'm reformed, it's like we are a group that only people, only people, I guess, of our caliber can get in. And, and it's not a trying to reach us. So I'm even thinking about re removing the name the reformed from my bio and Instagram and things like that, because sometimes it kind of separates us from other people. So if we are really to reach everyone, maybe it's not best to, you know, kind of seclude ourselves and, and at the same time. Yeah. But yeah, my friends, um, this was good. This was amazing. This was beautiful. Um, it went way better than I expected. God really did this thing, you know. Um, so um, like like I said in the beginning, we're really just trying to reach people and make people understand the importance of the Reformation. This, everything we said is not something new. This is people um, like John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, Martin Luther, um, they all preach this. And most importantly, Paul the Apostle preached everything that we, we spoke about today. Um, and we're trying to reach out to our Catholic friends and not just our Catholic friends, but our Protestant friends who just lost the way of truth and who doesn't know how to defend Sola Fide, don't know how to defend Sola Gratia, they all the, the Solas, and who have just, you know, call themselves Protestants, but they're just really hopeless Catholics. Um, so yeah, bro, my brothers, thank you guys for coming. This was amazing. Uh, it was just so good to have you guys and talk to you guys. Um, and if you guys are watching for the first time on the YouTube, like I said in the beginning, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified every time I post another video. I got a special guest coming. Pretty sure you guys know him next week. And these boys who you see in front of you right now, we're going, we're going to continue the uh, series that I, I started on Calvinism. Um, it's going to be awesome. And like I said, make sure to subscribe, hit the like button to be notified. Um, I love you guys. Um, see you guys next video.